Hello, I'm Black History Maven. Thanks for joining me as I explore the White League insurrections of the 1870s and ask, is history repeating itself? On January 6, 2021, when I watched thousands of Trump supporters ransack the boundaries of legal protest, I was incredulous and horrified. By first storming the stairs of the US Capitol and next overcoming security by force and smashing windows with the attempt to thwart the presidential election certification, I felt like I was watching an invasion of democracy because I was. This was the first moment in my lifetime witnessing an attempted coup, but it wasn't anything new to the American government. The mostly white mob that stormed the US Capitol was actually continuing the work of the white vigilante groups from the early 19th century. We know that the U.S. Civil War ended legal enslavement in this country in 1865, but what many of us don't know is that during the period of 1867 to 1877, Black men were able to gain some political traction. This is because of their long-standing work in equal rights leagues, along with the tireless work of their wives, daughters, sisters, mothers, to bring suffrage to, for Black men in every state. The 15th Amendment in 1870 codified black men's suffrage, although for men to exercise this right was a different story, as we'll see. Multiracial organizations like the Union League supported black political activism, and back then it was the Republican Party that courted black voters and promised black rights. The Republicans were vilified by whites in the South, but this was the party that supported luminaries, that was supported by luminaries like Frederick Douglass and along with thousands of other black men as well as black women. During this time, around 2,000 black men served in political office as Republicans, locally in state legislatures and in Congress. But membership in white militias proliferated during this time too. The Ku Klux Klan might be the most known and most feared in American imaginations, but another organization, the White League, also formed in Louisiana in 1874. But first, a rewind. In 1872, a contentious gubernatorial election took place in Louisiana. In office since 1868 was Republican Governor Henry Clay Wormoth. His lieutenant governor was Black, a man named Oscar Dunn, who was a civic leader in the African-American community. Their election into state government was backdropped by national violence. A terrorist organization called the Knights of the White Camillas, as well as the KKK, resorted to horrifying violence of Black Americans to beat back votership, literally, in that year's presidential election. And it almost worked. The D Democratic presidential candidate carried the South, although Ulysses Grant ultimately won the presidential election. But these white supremacists learned that extreme violence and intimidation could achieve their nefarious goals. So did Governor Wormoth. In Louisiana, he initiated a board called the State Returning Board to certify future elections in an effort to curb voter intimidation. In 1872, this board was put to the test when Republican Party candidate William Kellogg ran against Democrat John McHenry as Wormoth faced impeachment following party infighting and outfighting. Candidate John McHenry's was the party of white supremacy. In fact, during the campaign, uh, his followers carried a banner reading the words white supremacy. Um, and a newspaper crowed, we regard the McHenry ticket as representing the Negro-hating, schoolhouse-burning, fire-eating bourbonist. That's what the newspaper said. The election was plagued with fraud and the state returning board was split on a winner. J William Ken Kellogg brought the case to federal court and the judge ruled in his favor. Wormoth was unseated and his lieutenant governor, a black man named Pinckney Pinchback, who'd taken office when his predecessor, Oscar Dunn, died, assumed state governorship for 35 days. And he was the first and last black US governor until 1988. Democrats were furious, especially with 68 black men and 77 white men elected to the legislature. But before Republican Kellogg was seated, 
John McHenry gave a speech to a town hall of supporters asking them to take up arms and get him in office. And they did. On Easter Sunday, 1873, a horde of white guerrillas murdered around 150 African Americans in a small town courthouse. It was the town of Colfax in Louisiana. Why Colfax? Because African American activists had already taken possession of the courthouse to prevent a swearing in and an, of an unelected racist sheriff and judge. Terrified for their families' lives under a regime of unchecked brutality, they staged a coup of their own. Surrounded by white militias, these activists had no choice but to surrender. Their white flag was met with more white violence. They were executed. Stacks of bodies filled the street. Others were pushed into the Mississippi River. This, while the few white militia members who died were memorialized as heroes, in a plaque, this tragedy was marked as the end of carpetbag misrule in the South. In terms of numbers, there would be no amount of massacre deaths in the early 1870s that would surpass what happened in Colfax. But the lengths white militias would take to outstrip this attempted coup would. One of the murderers from the massacre started a paper which was named, wait for it, the Caucasian. He and others thought it was time for another militia. The camellias in the Ku Klux Klan were apparently not enough. And so in 1874, the La Blanche, it's Louisiana, so everything is sort of French, uh, or the White League was born. Chapters formed across the South. And unlike the KKK and others, this group didn't try to conceal their identity. They were completely unmasked. Sound familiar? From their own little racist imaginations, they fabricated an enemy. Conspiracy theory was spread that there was a group called the Black League, because, you know, black people think everything white folks do, do is cool and adopt it as our own. That's what we do. A New Orleans paper ran a story about this make-believe black league. And back then, just about every news outlet was Fox News. The blacks, they say, are planning an armed invasion. The paper reported that black men would kill as many white men as possible and take for themselves all the white women. En masse. White men of every station swore allegiance to the White League, from carpenters, hostlers, and tinsmiths to lawyers and businessmen. And the violence, which never stopped, continued. Individual Black people are killed, men, women, and children. In his town called Cushada, a, blue, a group of Black and white Republicans are murdered after a fake trial. The White League grows. There are officers. Companies of them drill in the streets of New Orleans, just like a legitimate military regiment might drill in a field. They have in mind the 1874 election. Harper's Weekly, a Northern newspaper, calls the White League a band of assassins. On September 14th, 1874, masses of armed men gather. Stoked by a rally, they march towards the French Quarter. They are organized, building barricades along intersections as they had previously mapped out. Many are former Confederate soldiers and officers. They know war tactics. There are 3,500 armed white militiamen and 3,000 defenders, about a third of them black, members of the police force or the state militia. Around 3.45 p.m., an arm of the White League lurches towards the state house. And a little history about the New Orleans State House. Previously, it had been moved to the site of a former hotel, and that hotel was once the City Exchange, an auction house of enslaved property. Back to that day in 1874, the police are armed too. They've got a Gatling gun, the first machine gun, poised in the center of Canal Street. But sharpshooters of the White League taking cover behind cotton bales dispatch with the Gatling gun operators. The police commander who's defending the city is injured in the fray, and his men break ranks and scatter. Injured, too, is the commander of the state militia, also defending the city. Ten White League members and ten defenders are killed. By early evening, more are dead, and defenders outmaneuvered have barricaded themselves in the statehouse or the armory. 
Freshly armed White League troops arrive and these guerrilla forces surround the armory and the state house demanding surrender. The defenders have no option. This time when they surrender, they are allowed to go free. They are allowed to live. The White League lose 16 people. Fewer of the defenders are killed. 13 die, although dozens more are wounded. During the carnage, gaggles of civilians stood by watching the battle as if it were a theater show. Six were killed. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. The White League claims the ultimate prize. They seize the state. At this time, New Orleans, not Baton Rouge, is the capital city. The White League st stalls railroad trains of US Army troops and swear in an unelected governor. They run patrols around the city, acting as self-appointed police officers. Finally, US Army regiments do reach the capital and President Grant flanks the city with Navy gunboats. William Kellogg is reinstalled as Republican governor. But white supremacy has an unbreakable grip. Still, Republicans lose the state legislature. White League companies continue to drill in the streets, a show of force and intimidation. Northern cartoons take note of this de facto White League rule. The White League turns their viciousness to schools in an effort to staunch black efforts towards uppity thinking. Students are torn out of classrooms and beaten by White League members. Remember Governor Pinchback, the first uh, black US governor? His kids, among many others, are ripped out of schoolhouse desks and beaten up. And a 17 year old black school teacher, Julia Hayden, is shot in Tennessee. Racist violence doesn't end. So on January 6, with hordes of Trump supporters breaking into the US Capitol, thwarting the electoral process with the literally and figuratively unmasked violence, of course, I thought of those little, little remembered massacres of the early 1870s. Because yes, there were some people of color in the Capitol insurgency last week, but ultimately, what were the masses fighting for? Why was the force deployed so differently than it was this past summer during Black Lives Matter protests? The Capitol insurrection could have been far more horrible than it was. More people could have been killed. If members of the mob had their way, we could have lost lawmakers and more police officers and civilians. But when I ask what was this insurgency fighting for, I think I know the answer. And I think it's along the lines of what white militia men fought for, murdered for in the 1870s. Most, many people are still trying to get the taste of a black presidency out of their mouths. And the idea of a black and an Indian American woman vice president is a bitter pill. There is a disgust that the Black Lives Matter movement and protests were the most multiracial and multinational in history. There is a fundamental phobia of more people of color voting of a multiracial democracy in the US. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes, right? Well, guess what? White supremacy is a stupid prize and not and also an unwinnable one. Black people and gay people and immigrants aren't going anywhere. Actually, I should say, we're going places, just not away. The 2020 presidential election was a legal democratic process. And actually, perhaps due to the work of people like Stacey Abrams, it might have actually been the most, the least disenfranchising election in US history. Just like nobody stole your job and nobody stole your seat at, a, at, a, at your college, nobody stole your election. If you think otherwise, I'll say this. The only thing rigged is your brain. All right, let's go and see if we have any comments. Thank you all so much for watching. Doesn't look like we have any comments, but thank you again for watching and I appreciate everyone being here.